Uh, Philip Blonde is someone who's contributed very considerably to uh, both the Conservative debate and the political debate in the United Kingdom generally. Um, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important contributions he has made is um, identifying conservatism as distinct from neoliberalism and indeed uh, liberalism generally. Um, there are a number of people, uh, there is no doubt, that are conservatives who do not feel uh, that we should be leaving the European Union. Peter Hitchens, for example, hates the EU, uh, but doesn't think we have a government capable of delivering it. There may be some truth in that, it would appear. Um, so I'm now going to hand over uh, to Philip to give an alternative perspective this evening and how he sees the state of politics from that perspective. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ben, and uh, it, it's lovely to be here. I like Brexiteers. Uh, um, I do because because they have a deep sense of what is wrong <coughs> and they want to speak to that and nor are they complacent um, <coughs> in how we approach that. So what I want to talk about is what's gone wrong in our country and in our political and economic settlement that's, that's led to, to where we are. And I want to talk about long causes. Then I want to talk about what really is great about Britain, because I don't think great is a geographical term. I think arguably it is the greatest empire since Rome, and it's hard to think of anything else that stands equal to British history and British legacy. But I want to explore what that is, and I want to suggest being true to that legacy leads to a different relationship to Europe than the one we currently have, and to the one advocated for by those um, who want a Brexit. So basically, where are we? Where, where are we in our, in our uh, political shift? I think we're in a post-liberal moment. We're in um, a world where we have been governed by left liberalism, the predominantly social and cultural liberalism, this is a post-liberal moment. Thank you very much. This is what I most needed. Proper job. Uh, it's Eurofish. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you for the fraternity, brother. Um, determinism. So, we have been governed by, um, essentially since the 1960s, a left-driven project of social liberalism. And since the 1970s, um, late 1970s, a right-driven project of economic liberalism. And the two have come together. Um, it's quite interesting to date when and where, um, and they have resulted in the complete destruction of the lives and stability of the poor. I do a lot of polling, I do a lot of work with um, centre-right parties in Europe, and everywhere I poll, the two dominant concerns are fear on the part of those who are polled about the future of their children, and fear about their parents. What marks the modern European polity, and indeed marks the American polity, is insecurity. And I want to argue tonight in three parts. First part is what has delivered us to modern insecurity is extreme liberalism and being governed from extreme liberalism. Now, this doesn't mean I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm not a liberal. I'm not an absolutist. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to prohibit freedom of speech. I, I, I want a radical freedom of speech agenda. And I don't think I know the truth. And I have no sinister project uh, um, involving dictators. But I do not think any tradition of liberty comes from liberalism. And I think the type of liberalism we've got now which is a be like me liberalism. It's no longer the modus vivendi liberalism, live and let live. It's be like me or pay the penalty. Mm. Be like me or I will get the state to persecute you. We are in persecutory, a phase of persecutory liberalism, which if you study philosophy uh, or read philosophy, you don't have to study it, you can just read it. Um, it's there in Rousseau, it's there in Hobbes, it's there in Rousseau's notion of the general will. Now, what has liberalism done? Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure that most of you won't agree with um, much of what I'm saying, but I suspect all of you will agree with some of what I'm saying. What liberalism has done economically, let's do the easy bit first, because all the evidence suggests that the economic uh, drivers of Brexit are not as important as the cultural drivers. So culture is more important. Meaning is more important than money. Um, but let's talk about money. 
what we have, modern economics speaks a good talk on the free market, but all it has delivered is monopolies, economic concentration and oligopolies. Mm -hmm. We live now, if you analyse almost any market, in a situation that has moved from arguably 15 companies in a market to two or three. They have all adopted dominant positions. Most other uh, companies are in what's called laggard positions and they can never catch up. And if you actually look where profits are taken, they're mostly taken at the top and we have essentially monopoly dominance of, uh, of our economy. The terrifying thing is, is this has happened on the watch of free market conservatives. It's happened on through the consumer welfare standard in competition law. And there hasn't been a single innovation coming from any of the neoliberal free market conservatives that say, actually, look, there's a real problem uh, with our market. Now, it's been some the only decent work has really been done in America. Um, and uh, two academics, De Goot and Eckhart, who are of Dutch extraction, did an analysis of markups. And they found that in, in all, all the mature markets they studied, the, the markups have gone up by something like 40% for all goods. Now, if you enter the digital arena, it's even more. <clears throat> now, what does this mean? This means that the rewards or the returns to labor have dropped through the floor. Mm -hmm. This means capital has uh, taken a utterly dominant position over labor and the returns to wages and the returns to labor. I mean, it's different for different countries and they have different distributional mechanisms. But if I recall, uh, the last act, virtually the last act of the Labour government in 2010, was to do um, an inequality survey. And they did the income one, and they saw that between the bottom decile and the top decile, after allowing for welfare redistribution, the difference is 10 to 1. But if you look at assets, the difference is 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1, 10,000 to 1, a million to 1, depending on how high up the top decile you go. And what we're gradually converting to is what I would call a rentier economy. That is an economy where despite what you earn, you will never own. You will always rent, not just your home, but anything else. So the possibility for you to self-define yourself through labour or through running a small business is essentially because the markets have been captured by the new uh, monopolists and they bought off governments. Uh, Google and Obama is a very good uh, example in America to an enormous degree. Now what this means is everybody is made economically insecure because wages uh, are kept as low as possible and people can't use free market moves to essentially empower themselves. I call it tentatively, I'm writing a new book, The New Serfdom in reference to certain famous economists, um, but actually serfdom was better. I don't in the Middle Ages, if you were a serf and you created a surplus, you could keep that surplus. Mm. But nobody doing wage labour today, apart from those right at the top, can create a surplus. Mm -hmm. It's not there for us. <laughs> so what you have is deep and structural and abiding economic insecurity for people. Mm -hmm. Not being able to house themselves, not being able to look after themselves. Um, coupled with that, you then have the more difficult subject of social liberalism. Now, there's a really brilliant book by uh, a chap called Ivan uh, Kraschev uh, called After Europe, which I'd encourage you all to read. And in that book, he makes the point that social liberalism has been used by the elite to make war on majorities. And that what happens is that elites ally with minorities or perceived minorities to take apart the social settlements of majorities. And that can be along any form of line around sexual behaviour, around uh, what you teach and what you're allowed to think and group think. Now this is fine if you're upper middle class and you don't, you know, you can sleep with who you want, you can do what you want because you've got assets and you're okay and you've been brought up uh, by a stable family. But it's death and destruction for working class people who are denied social stability, who are denied the possibility of marriage because marriage is essentially now denied to them socially and stability is denied to them socially. And we have essentially denied any form of solidarity for people, for the structures of solidarity in their lives. So what do I mean by that? That sounds a bit vague, a bit, a bit obtuse. So if you're a one earner family, so think of families, think of children. <coughs> 
We know, for instance, that the gender pay gap is no such thing. We know that it's a pregnancy gap. All of the evidence across Europe says that 80 to 90% of the pay gap is when women have children. And when women have children, they go to, they leave their job. Um, women with degrees outcompete men, by the way. They, they earn more than men. They're more successful than men up to the age of 30. But when, for, you know, for many good reasons, no doubt. Um, but when they leave and they have children, they pay a massive pregnancy or child penalty. Now, what's interesting about when you've destroyed a society's sense of solidarity and all you do is encourage rabid individualism is you don't reward the foundational solidarity that we need. What's the most foundational form of solidarity we human beings have? It's family. The family. Yeah. And what structure do we penalise most? The family. Now, almost all families adopt a one earner model through young children and the overwhelming majority of women, it's over 70%, would like to stay longer with their children and look after their children during the earlier years than uh, go back to work. But we tax that family unit higher than anyone else in the OECD. We tax uh, twice as much as the French, 15 times as much as the Germans. We penalise all forms of solidarity. So what I want to suggest to you is that what we, and, and there's so much about this, the, the poorer you are, the less money you earn, the lonelier you are, the more socially isolated. What are the two single greatest determinants still in this country of what will happen to you? This is what the Greeks called fate. Does anyone know the two indicators that when combined that compete anything else? Parental wealth. No. Interesting. Interestingly enough, Jeez. not. It's your mother's level of education and the postcode where you're born. Wow. Mm. That is destiny, my friends. Mm. So, we have created a society where people are neither socially nor economically insecure, uh, uh, secure, where they can't hope for their children, they fear for what happens to their parents. This is the new reality that lies behind all forms of populism in my view from Trump right through to the, the popularity of the current regime in say Hungary and or Poland. So and what has brought this about? Radical liberalism has brought this about. What is liberalism at base is me myself and I and then the argument from me myself and I that this benefits everybody else. Now we Arguably, it does in certain stages of economic development. You know, it's clear that capitalism has worked for the Chinese. But if you look at the very famous elephant graph by the World Bank economist, whose name I always invert, it's kind of a vague um, problem of dyslexia that's fused into my brain. But um, Milan Brankovic's elephant graph. This shows the distribution of uh, economic gains on a global basis um, since uh, the 1970s. And it shows very clearly that the Western working class hasn't benefited from economic growth, that none of it has gone to them and it's all gone to workers in Asia, India, China, China mostly. That's where we are. So what do we now promise through forms of radical liberalism? We only promise insecurity and we can only offer you insecurity. They're the long trends, I think, that lie behind Brexit. Now add in something else. Add in migration. The overwhelming evidence from all of the very good academics is that migration was the, is the great driver, it is the great fear. And then there's the tacit fear of Islamic migration, which everyone is too frightened to research, but was certainly live at the time of, of the Brexit vote, the time when Merkel threw, threw open um, the borders of Germany. And what um, migration does, and all the evidence shows this, is it creates very extreme levels of distrust between people because ethnicity as a basis is something wired into our evolutionary genetics. <laughs> it takes very sophisticated forms of culture to get over it. Now I want to go, just leave that there, let me go to part two. Sorry if I'm speaking too long, uh, yell at me if, if, if it gets boring. Um, but this is now the exciting thing. So why does Britain matter? Why, why do I think, and I'm not saying you are, and I'm not saying Brexit is. So what do I like about Brexit is? What do I like about those who argue for Brexit? Well, predominantly because they have a sense of loss. They grasp 
that we need a form of social conservation. I like that. Prominently, they, gr they grasp also that um, economically something is profoundly wrong in our distributive mechanism. But mostly, what I love about Brexiteers is their patriotism. They love this country. I love this country. I remember when I was a small boy, um, you know, it's quite funny really, the formative, the formative kind of text for me as a small boy was Our Island Story, which I'm sure mm. you've, all, you've all read, which I discovered in my grandfather's attic, and for me it was a magical book. Then Lord of the Rings, and then the Bible. And that was the order of discernment, really, for me, which I think is quite funny. And I've learned a lot from Plato and Aristotle, but nothing quite competes with those texts. And <clears throat> what one learns is that um, human civilization jumps, it leaps frogs, and it isn't linear. There is no weak theory of history. And the greatest leap that human beings make is when they realise that they share something universal. This is what, in my view, Judaism, which is the first, um, depending where you place Buddhism and the Vedic texts, but is the first form of universalism that subjects local power to justice. Because what's different about Judaism, and I love Judaism, what's different about Judaism is it is the prophets came and condemned Herod. Now, broadly speaking, the political history of the world, that had never happened before. What is that? Normally, gods sanctify the existing social order. That's the role of gods. What Judaism did is it said even the existing social order must obey justice, divine justice. Then you fast forward to Plato and Aristotle, and what the Greeks said is actually there are objective moral orders and there are objective moral laws. And Western civilization is essentially a fusion of, of Judaism and Christianity and Plato, which is that we abide by these universal truths that don't just limit us as nations. In fact, the essence of what Plato and Aristotle argued and the essence of what um, Christianity argued is nations are secondary and what is primary is, is humanity. Now why I love Britain, um, apart from its landscape, which is, is, is clearly mirrored in heaven, is, is that Britain is a civic empire. Britain has never had a theory of race. And if we did have people who thought about race, we sent them to Norway to practice very unpleasant forms of eugenics. It actually had really unpleasant consequences for Scandinavia. We have always had a civic account of what it is to be British, i.e. that it didn't have anything to do with your skin colour. And in point of fact, if you look back to the Hastings judgment in the 18th century that said no, no one who lands on Britain can be a slave, one can understand the American Revolution as a revolution arguably of slave owners against a monarchical British Republic that aimed to free all slaves. And if you doubt this, then read um, Robert Toon's marvellous book on the English that tells you about the 60-year war that Britain fought against slavery because we thought black people were people too. And we deployed one-sixth of the Royal Navy in the Atlantic to intercept slave ships and freed at sea over 300,000 people. We even employed the Royal Navy uh, in the east of Africa and um, the Seychelles, I went into the Seychelles, I went there on holiday and they have a museum. And you go into the first room in the museum, and there's a museum of uh, the French room, which is French slavery, you know, French Revolutionary Republican slavery. And they have bars and chains. And you go into the British room, and they paint, they've painted this huge mural of the British arriving, sinking the French ships and letting them all free. Not only did the British do that, they then intercepted all the, uh, slave, the Arab slave trades up the coast with very small interceptor vessels and took them all to the Seychelles and set them free. And to this day, the Seychelles has the highest per capita income in Africa. That's the Britain I love. And the Britain I love really began with the Great Awakening around the time of Hogarth and ended really with the defeat of Nazism. And that's pretty bloody splendid in my view. And um, what we did, and of course there are many in any nation's history, there are high points and low points. But our overwhelming high point was that we were an international power, that we stood up for universal things, and we would fight and die for universal things, 
and we would call people brothers who other people didn't think were our brothers. This to me is British power, this is British potency, and this is what makes us and made us great. And it's the legacy of that. Now, I don't, we will get into a debate in Europe. I have no problem with saying the European Union is this, that or the other. I'm not defending the current structures or democracy or the Commission or Juncker or any. I'm not defending that. But what I want to suggest to you is if what matters to you is, is British goodness and British um, power, which is what matters to me, I think it's a fatal mistake to turn away from Europe. This is where we start to get annoyed with me, which I apologise for. But let me say why. Because by 2050, on present trends, Britain would have had the largest economy and the largest population in Europe. We would be the dominant player in Europe with the most effective military, a military that comes second only to the US, even bigger at the moment and more potent because of our logistics um, than the Chinese, we would be, I know it sounds laughable, but if you look at every serious analysis of hard and soft power, we're either first or second. <laughs> Toombs again talks about that the British have a declinist thesis and that they think they're declining and it's a long cultural history of that. And I think Brexit is part of a declinist thesis and I think it's wrong. I think we're hugely powerful, we're hugely important, and we should not leave the platform from which we can govern and shape the 21st century. Now, let, now what I fear, and I understand you disagree with me, and, and uh, that, that's fine. What I fear is that we, alone and isolated, no, we will still be important, but what's the global legacy of Singapore? What's the global legacy of Switzerland? What's the global legacy of countries that isolate themselves? Not very much. And if you really want to shape in this land where battle and war carry such a cost, power comes from not being isolationist. Power comes from being interconnected and shaping and challenging all the forces that face us on the most global levels you can. Now, the crucial difficulty, and I know it's a difficulty, I, you know, John Curtis, I'm just watching in it, a, a interview before I came down here said only one in eight of us feel European. That's a problem for my position. I accept that. But what I want to suggest is if Britain wants to also shape and rule in part the 21st century, what it has to do is very different from what it did in the 20th, in the 19th, in the 18th, in the 17th. We have always sought geopolitically to divide Europe and rule the world. <laughs> and the world, I think, has done well out of it. What we must now do is unite Europe in order to have the same global projection. And if you actually look at Europe, I think the Liberals are in trouble. Macron endured his 18th weekend of his disenfranchised white indigenous uh, working class saying, actually, you know what, Emmanuel, you know, it's not working for us. Europe at this juncture is moving in our direction at every point from Poland to Romania to even in Germany itself. And I have sat and gone for dinners with four European nations and politicians of those who begged us not to leave and said, for Christ's sake, don't leave us alone with the Germans or don't leave us alone with the French. <laughs> and, you know, like no doubt many of you, like no doubt many of you, my relatives have died in Europe. My, um, my grandmother's brother was an Everton footballer and he was killed at Monte Cassino. And no doubt many of you have relatives who died on, in Europe. I don't think they died to hand Europe back to the powers. No, I'm just saying that it's patriotic. I'm not, I'm not I'm in any way impugning your take, which is different from mine. But I'm just telling you why I feel it patriotically. I'm just explaining my own emotional. I don't feel that we, that we should sacrifice. The sacrifices we've done from Europe means we should depart from it. Now, what I want to ensure is British power in the 21st century. And I think with American isolationism, with the rise of a, a deeply authoritarian, insidious and dangerous Chinese superpower, with Russia prepared to do almost anything uh, in order to increase its own prestige. Until it drops dead. Uh, maybe. <laughs> What we, what we have to do 
is to essentially create a different relationship with Europe in Europe for the sake of our own power. There is no serious economic argument for the departing of Europe. There is a cultural argument and there is a meaningful argument that I fully respect. But what I would say to you is if you, like me, and I suspect in this you are, believe in British power and greatness, the platform for that is Europe. The yeah. constituency for that is both here and in Europe, where we are not hated and where in many parts we are loved. <laughs> and we can... <laughs> I know that sounds odd, but I think it's true. It is rubbish. I think it's true. And it's, fair, it's a fair point. But we should I listen. I don't, we should listen. No, no, I don't, we should listen. I don't have any problems with you disagreeing with me. I'm telling you what I think. Yeah. And I think that, that we're loved. And I think for the sake of British greatness and not to make us small, because we will be smaller by this, we have to, I think, realign with Europe. Then let me finish. I realise you're shaking your head. <laughs> but I thank you for your kindness in listening to me, genuinely. Let me finish then. Because the real agenda, what really upsets me, is all of those who've advocated for Brexit have not come up with any policies that speak to the reasons why people voted. For what? There are no policies on, on tax, on emancipation, on, on creating new levels of ownership. There are no policies that will redeem the situation of being governed by extreme liberalism. And part of our task is not to just do this and create a post-liberal policy offer in the UK, but also in Europe. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>